Okay. So broadly, being sensitive, how, how can we make our communication sensitive? There could be many aspects to it. But broadly, I talk about these three ways in which we can communicate in anything. This can apply even to our outreach, when we present Krishna consciousness and it can apply even to how we give some feedback or correction to others. So, broadly it is prescriptive, normative and descriptive. Prescriptive means like a doctor gives a prescription, you know, take this, do not take this. So, in prescription, we are putting ourselves in a position of authority and there we are giving commands. Now, we may feel sometimes that in a particular interaction, in a particular relationship, we are in the position of authority. So, first let me just overview these three, then I will explain each of these. Prescriptive means that this is right, this is what you should do, this is what you should not do. If there are normative means, it is the norm, not, no, it is not related with normals, but it is related with norm. Norm is, this is a standard way of doing it. This is right, this is wrong. So, we are, when we are being prescriptive, it is directly telling that person, you should not do this. In normative, we are, this is the right thing, that is the wrong thing. So, indirectly we are saying that you should not do this or you should do this. Whereas, in descriptive, what are we doing? We are saying that this is, this is what I am doing and this is why I am doing it or this is what I would do and this is why I would do it. So, we are basic, basically, when we are being descriptive, what are we doing? Yesterday, there was a question that sometimes in, in trying to understand others, in trying to be sensitive, be, be try, to ex, try to acknowledge their frame of reference, what about our own individuality? Should not we express ourselves? Yes, we express ourselves, but express ourselves in a descriptive way, not in a prescriptive way. So, from, from my frame of reference, this is what, this is how I see it and this is what I am doing. So, we are not denying our individuality, we are not suppressing our perspective. But we are not imposing our perspective on others. In fact, in today's postmodern world, the, you know, we had pre-modern times, modern times, and postmodern times. So, in the pre-modern times, uh, it was more or less in the India or the West, scripture was considered to be the authority, whether it was the Vedas or the Bible or the Quran, whatever. That was the pre-modern times. Modern times, scripture was largely replaced by science. That Sci whatever, if something is scientific, then we accept it, otherwise reject it. Now, today the world is moving more and more towards what is called the postmodern times. Postmodern means here people feel that there is no reliable authority at all. Even science, even scientists have their, uh, their agendas. Science, many scientists may be searching for truth at an individual level, but scientific institutions, scientific forums, they are, they want power, they want funds, they want prestige and there have been many uh, things associated with science also and especially because scientific findings have been used for a lot of bad purposes like weapons of mass destruction. So, earlier science was seen as a source of universal good, at least it, it, now it is used extensively, we cannot live without technology most of the time, but it is not seen that science is a source of reliable knowledge all the time. So. So, in postmodern times, people do not accept any authority. You may say, how can you live without authority? Yeah, we have to live and we do, it is not that we do not accept any authority at all. But, people do not like authority to be presented as an authority. That means, you tell your experience, if it makes sense to me, I will accept it. So, say for example, if we are having a get together in our office and then everybody is taking meat, but we are taking vegetarian food. Now, somebody asks us, now why do not you take, why do you, why do not you take the food which we are having or why do you take only vegetarian food? Now, the descriptive way would be to tell why we do what we do. If somebody says, actually those who eat meat, they put carcasses into their body and they make their body into a graveyard. <laughs> you know, that is going to shock people, alienate people. We are not going to, even if some famous thinker has said that in the past and we are simply quoting them. It's, it's not going to work. People are going to feel alienated by that. Or if we say that, you know, 
you know, what what to speak of IIT, IIT vegetarian, you should also become vegetarian. Now, why, why, you, why do you kill animals to eat food? Now, what are we doing? If I tell, you should also eat, you should also not eat meat. So, what are we doing over there? Which of these three? Prescriptive. Prescriptive. Now, who are you to tell me? You know, in today's world, the, the oh, see what has happened is that most people, especially in the last 20, 30 years, the world has changed more than the last 200 years, 200, 300 years because of all social media coming up. So, there is a, always the, the teenage generation, every new generation has a sense of rebelliousness that we do not want to be told what we should do. But for some people, that teenage rebelliousness goes on throughout their life almost. <laughs> so, that rejection of authority becomes their driving motive for doing everything. That is why if anybody is told to do something, people do not accept it. And this is one significant difference between say, you could say Eastern cultures, Indian, Chinese culture and Western culture. Western culture has become significantly horizontal. Indian culture is significantly vertical. So, even in, even in offices, I think in the western places you never use, you do not refer to your boss as sir. Just you know, just refer to, call them by the name. Even your professors you call by the name. And I was surprised even, uh, I was with some youth in America, they call their mother and father also by their names only, not even mom and dad. Just they call them by the name. So, now for an Indian it would seem very odd, how can you call like that? But broadly that is the way the culture has become. So, it is not necessarily we have to adopt the culture, but we have to necessarily we have to understand the mindset behind the culture. So, the mindset is that people do not want anyone to throw their weight around on them. And you know, this is the right, this authority and you have to do it. In fact, uh, this can go to an extreme where even the medical profession, now even doctors have stopped being prescriptive. I was one devotee, he had a fracture and he was telling me that he went to a doctor and the doctor told him that, you know, okay, in this fracture, the x-ray shows this. So, you could just wait for three months and see if the hand heals. You will have to rest. You can do the surgery, this can happen. You can do this kind of surgery or you can do this kind of surgery or you can do this kind of therapy or you can just wait and watch. You know, if you do this, this can be the, this may happen. If you do this, this may happen. If you do this, this may happen. If you do this, this may happen. Now, what do you want to do? <laughs> now, we say, okay, you know, he has to take a decision. But this is, generally, if you go to a doctor, the doctor can give us some options, but the doctor, if the doctor expects the patient to take the ultimate decision with respect to surgery, certainly the doctor has to get consent. But there are times when the doctor has to tell. You know, do this, don't do this. This is what he said. So, if the doctor becomes very deferential to the patient's will, then how will how will any kind of treatment be given say as parents sometimes the child doesn't want to eat healthy food the parents have to tell eat healthy food isn't it so it's required but the point is that overall today's ethos is such that people don't want to people don't like in general the authoritative way of speaking so being sensitive means that there is the there is the message that we are speaking and there is the manner in which we are speaking. So, we are not talking about changing the message. We are talking simply about changing the manner in which we speak. So, the way we speak, if it is, if it is either normative or prescriptive, it puts off people. And it is interesting that even <clears throat> in the animal kingdom, see sometimes we say in the animal kingdom, the might is right. Now, whichever is the strongest animal that we, wins. But even in the animal kingdom, they have found that say if there is a group of chimpanzees or a group of uh, uh, bears, naturally the chimpanzee which is the biggest will become the leader of the group. But even among that group, the, if that chimpanzee is domineering, just my way is the only way. Then sooner or later, two, three other chimpanzees come together and they pull down that chimpanzee. They attack and destroy the chimpanzee. 
So even in the animal kingdom, it is found that certainly might is important, but whoever becomes a leader of a pack doesn't stay long if they resort only to might. It is if just if might is there, then sooner or later they are overthrown. But even in the animal kingdom, so there was an experiment done with, res with respect to some mice or rather rats. And like there is a small rat and a big rat. Even rats play. Now they may just play, and then actually it's amazing that even they uh, rats sometimes like they play and they wrestle. Now wrestle means you know one rat tries to push the other rat down, the other rat tries to push the first rat down. Now if there are two rats and one is bigger than the other, so then after some time. Say naturally the two are playing, the bigger rat will pin down the other rat. So once, twice, thrice it happens and if each time the bigger rat wins and after that the smaller rat stops playing. So smaller rat stops playing after that and the bigger rat there is no one to play with. So when they did this experiment they found that every once in a while, every after 5-6 times the bigger rat deliberately allows the smaller rat to win. <laughs> the bigger rat allows the smaller rat to win. And then when it's clear that the bigger rat is that bigger rat is bigger and is the winner, so the bigger rat is once, twi once, once, twice, thrice, four times, then within those experiments, it's quite it's interesting that actually the smaller rat has to invite the bigger rat to play. Because play is voluntary. If the smaller rat doesn't want to play, then the bigger rat has no one to play. So, the bigger, if the bigger rat simply uses force and wins each time, the smaller rat thinks there is no fun over here, I cannot win any time. And then the smaller rat refuses to play. So, the bigger rat in its own way recognizes that I cannot simply rely on might. So, like we also, in our, when, when our children are playing, we may tell them that, it's not winning only that matters, it's how you play also that matters. Now you should play in a sportsman, play, play, in a, a play in a nice way, don't yell at others if you start losing, don't get angry, don't yell, don't become violent. So now we may say, children may say what, you know, winning is what matters. But the point is that life is not just, in, in, it's not just one play that you have, one game you have to play and win. For a children, for children, they want to be invited to play again and again. If a child they, that is, becomes very disagreeable, domineering and wins. But then after that, the other children don't like that child only. Say, we don't want to play with you. Then that child is left alone. So for the child, being able to play regularly is more important than winning immediately. Naturally, everybody wants to win. But if some players, if some, some children start playing so aggressively that nobody wants to play with them, then that is a bigger loss for them. So, just like in the Australian cricket team, they were known infamous for sledging. And eventually they crossed a line and two of the top players, they were banned from cricket for some time. So, you want to be aggressive but don't be so aggressive that you cross a line where people start feeling that you are disagreeable. So, it's now same principle applies to relationships. See, when we, I'm going to, talk, we're going to, next point is going to be intimacy. But in, even when there is a formal relationship, see some relationships we form as a, I mean, in a profession we are colleagues, some relationships we have, as we come together as devotees, some relationships are like blood relationships, where we are born with those relationships or we have formed those relationships through marriage or whatever else, or we have children or whatever. But, but now, now some relationships may be circumstantially forced, we have to work with some people. Some relationships may be there because we are relatives. But ultimately, every relationship is voluntary. In the sense that, not that the relationship itself can be given up, but how close the other person comes in that relationship. That nobody can force. Nobody can force. You know, if a child is upset and the parents say, what happened? Now, the parents may ask, but the child has to voluntarily open up. The child doesn't open up, the parents can't force open the mouth of the child and speak. You know, the child is upset about something, the child has to open up. And what applies to the speaking applies even more to the heart. So, relationships, there is, there may be an obligatory aspect to them. 
but there is also a voluntary aspect to them. We may work together on an obligatory basis, but whether we share with each other, that is voluntary. And unless there is that feeling that this person is not going to dominate me. So, for that voluntary opening of the heart, the manner in which we conduct ourselves is important. Just like those um, rats when they play, it's voluntary. So, relationships, there is an obligatory aspect where we may have to work together, but there is a voluntary aspect where how much people open each, to each other. And there was an American comedian, Woody Allen, he said that, you know, my wife and I, we stay in different rooms, we drive different cars, we enter and leave the house through different doors, we eat at different times, we are doing everything possible to keep our marriage together. <laughs> <laughs> so, now what is there to be together? If there is no sharing at all, that means it's an obligatory thing is there, but voluntary there is nothing there. It's actually keeping a complete distance from each other. So, there is a, there is a voluntary aspect and intimacy in terms of emotional intimacy or spiritual intimacy, it cannot be forced. If you want to, two people have to come close to each other in any relationship, it has to be voluntary. And in general, the descriptive way helps even if the other person accepts what we say or don't accept, doesn't accept what we say. The descriptive way helps the other person to understand why we are doing what we are doing or why we are the way we are, why we think the way we think. And when we speak in a prescriptive way, it is just like we are the authority and we are telling the other person what we are doing, what you, that person should do rather. So, one way of being sensitive is that everybody has their own free will. Everybody has their autonomy and we respect their autonomy by not being prescriptive. We respect their autonomy by not being prescriptive. In fact, one of my friends was writing a book on the Bhagavad Gita and he said that he is thinking of writing a book called the 10 commandments of the Bhagavad Gita. Like there are Bible 10 commandments. So I told him, please don't write a book like this. The Bhagavad Gita's mood is not of giving commandments. The Bhagavad Gita's mood is more of choices and consequences. The end of the Bhagavad Gita Krishna is telling Vimrishaita Dasheshena Yathechisata Kuru. In 18.63 he says, Now deliberate and do as you desire. So of course, there are certain statements which are instructive, no doubt. But the overall mood of the Bhagavad Gita, nowhere does Krishna say, I am God and you have to obey me. If you don't obey me, I will send you to hell. When, even when Krishna talks about hell, it is not about because you are disobeying me, you will go to hell. Krishna is talking about because somebody has de developed demoniac qualities, because of those demoniac qualities, they do demonic actions and that's why they go to hell. <coughs> so it is more of a demoniac dis disposition rather than simply disobedience. That, so Krishna is not in that mood of giving commandments. Says, so the Bhagavad Gita is, describes a God who who respects human independence. You, know, you have free will. It respects human independence and appeals to human intelligence. Now, deliberate. Vimrishaitad asheshena yatheshita kuru. Deliberate and do as you desire. So, being sensitive to people's free will means that we, we communicate with them largely in a descriptive way. So this was the first point about sensitivity. Any reflections or any questions about this? Yes. Um, the bad example which you gave, I can relate to the uh, gambling industry. Which industry? Gambling industry. Okay. Um, that's how they do. They make you win emotionally. <coughs> Not many times, so actually you just keep coming back to gamble more. And um, so they advertise everything and then at the end of the advertising they say gamble responsibly. They are the big rats, they want to win, they will keep winning all the money. <laughs> okay. So you have the small rat and they they make you feel like you are winning sometimes and that makes you keep coming back to the ending and keep losing most of the time. That's how I put it. Yeah, them. okay, yes, that's true. It can they say this principle can be abused also, like gambling industry may abuse it. Like even drug industry, the, the drug peddlers may give some free drug samples initially. 
but it's not always like that like even a parent while they're playing with a child the parent if a father is wrestling with a child now the, father, the child may just gentle fist the child may, the father will fall down now the child says oh i felt you down i felt you down now i bet you a child feels happy now what is the, the idea is that the parent wants to have this the sweet interaction and gradually the child grows up by that so this principle is universal it can be used for good purposes as well as bad purposes thank you example anyway yeah Maybe you could keep one mic on this side, so then in case anybody wants to speak, just keep. Can we move it faster then? Yes. Yeah. When I came to Australia, I found that more people here, as I said, there is the thing. Then we were in India. We are always restricting you have to do this, you have to do this, you don't get it. And we also started telling some people like that. And uh, that's good. But uh, what I found is our kids who are with that prescriptive mentality, they brought up with that prescriptive mentality. Then they come here and they come to the state of uh, prescriptive mentality. They are not uh, like that. Uh, they are not showing their natural ability. They think, oh, this is enough. So, like studies, our kids are brought up and saying, like, you, you need to be, become good, you need to mm. do a good thing. When they come here, they say, oh, you, you have done this all? This is great. They say, oh, this is great, this is great. And then what happens is, uh, when they come home and we say, you have to be taking good marks, they, they think, Oh, you people are very restrictive. Teacher doesn't say anything. You know, they appreciate and you don't appreciate. So this is kind of <laughs> mismatching. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Know, they, we have to be innovative or Okay, yeah, it's a good question. So because today say the culture here is is being not being prescriptive. So even if the uh, children do okay in the school, the teachers appreciate very much. But if you tell them that you have to do better, they feel that we are too demanding, we are too prescriptive. Yeah, it is a challenge. In fact, there is this, this phenomena in America called ABCD. It's there in Australia also. So ABCD is actually, Australian. yeah, it's Australian born. American born confused deshis. <laughs> So, the generation who came to America and settled, or they came to Australia and settled, you could apply. Then, the second generation is born over here, they, they, by their skin, their skin color is brown, so they can't entirely be Americans or Australians, but they are not Indians also, they don't think like Indians, so it's, it's, it's a confusion. And how to deal with it is, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but broadly speaking, each person, we have to see what helps them to move forward. Sometimes a person is lethargic, then they need a little bit of pushing. Sometimes the person is feeling burdened, then at that time they just need to be accepted and appreciated. So, it's, a, it's good if that, that everybody needs a little bit of pressure to perform. But sometimes the pressure can become so much that they collapse. So, some pressure has to come from parents, no doubt. And in general, because India is so competitive, there's so, just so much population over there, the competition is brutal. So, it's, everybody grows up with that ethos of ex working extremely hard. And as compared to that, competition is there here also, but it's not that bad as it is in India, especially in the student community. So, people, they, they may not feel wanting to perform so much. But there is some amount of pressure that can come laterally also from the peer pressure. But what happens, what peer pressure comes is more to look good, to appear smart, rather than actually to work hard and do study and perform. So that pressure is more with respect, that, is all, that external is, all, is there in India also, but it is not so much there. Here it is more external. So, it is a So with respect to this descriptive thing, I was going to talk this in intimacy in the next session, but uh, I'll explain this briefly. Uh, that 
broadly we can one human being can influence another human being only in three ways what are those three ways i call them as enlightenment engagement and encouragement so and that means we can enlightenment means rather than telling do this or don't do this we help them see the consequences of the actions rather than saying you have to get more marks you know with this marks you can get admission here but with this admission this is what you can do with this marks you can get admission here this is, this is what you will be able to do so show what we are able to see we need to be able to help them see that so that if we can do then they will themselves take responsibility more for the choices that they need to say so enlightenment means show them the choices before them and the consequence of those choices and so just telling them make this choice don't make this choice just show them the consequences so it's basically like uh, uh, help them if somebody wants to want somebody to take a particular go in a particular to a destination I'll tell them if this way will take you here this way will take you here then engagement means provide them some means to go along that way if say they are in a social group where nobody is studying very well so we all evaluate ourselves based on our peers to some extent that is we need comp comparing mentality we have say if we wake up in the morning and it is it's 4 o'clock i should wake up and we see everybody else sleeping I think why should i wake up maybe let me also sleep but if you wake up at 4 o'clock and see everybody has woken up oh i should also wake up so normally we naturally mold our actions according to our circle around us so if instead of just uh, telling them to do something if we can provide them some access to some studious circle maybe some tuitions maybe some group of students who are uh, maybe uh, maybe they enter into some group where others are also studying or if they provide them some facility for study so engagement means if you want to go along this way how can you go along that way that we provide and third is encouragement encouragement means that each person sometimes when people don't do a particular thing sometimes they just put on a facade that i don't care but it may not be like that it may be that i'm not sure whether i can do this and instead of trying it and failing and falling flat on my face better i will not try it only i'll act as if i don't care so often encouragement is what very much needed so encouragement can come in different ways and i'll talk about appreciation in the last part of our session uh, but we uh, that in, if we can offer encouragement in some way that means that whatever they do we appreciate it even if it is a small thing and then we encourage them to do more not in a demanding way but in a inspiring way <coughs> so how to do that i'll talk in the last session okay thank you any other comments okay yes hello Definitely. You know, they need to see how much fun we are having and how fun we are with each other. They don't think, okay, it looks like so much fun to join this. That's true. Yes, we need to present. People see our actions much more than our words or even our philosophy. So if people see that we are, we are nice, courteous, cheerful, and committed in our own way to what we are doing but people don't see our commitment so much commitment they will see but how, how we are courteous how we are cheerful if they see all that as a pro, uh, then that's what will attract them prabhupada said my followers are known as perfect gentlemen and ladies that's true thank you
Anything else? Yes. Thank you for the session. What happens is that it's not over yet. <laughs> the session is not over yet. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's okay. true. When the right message told in the wrong way, people don't accept it. So, there are times of course when prescriptive is required, but it's only when that person has accepted the authority. If still the person accepts the authority, if we before that only we give the prescriptive, then people just see us as domineering. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hi Krishna. Uh, Prabhu, I was just thinking that in the descriptive method that also empowers the other person to think for themselves. Mm. Because if you give the reason this is why I don't do it, then they can think, okay, this is a good reason to do it. Or uh, because I, I remember just uh, I think a typical example in many kids would be I would ask my mom why this, why that, and she would say, Don't ask me because I never asked my parents why well, just do it because I'm and that's, uh, I think, what kids are really putting on because uh, they're not empowered enough to know what the right reason to do things is. And so they may do it for some time to please your parents, but then eventually you may not do that. Whereas if you know why, and if you're given, given, the, um, given the, the awareness that you have the free will to think for yourself, and this is why you can do it, Yes, that's true. Yeah, when the kids when kids ask why, see knowing why gives them a reason for doing it. It's no guarantee that just by after knowing why they will do it, but not knowing why becomes a very ready-made excuse for not doing it. <laughs> if you don't give them a reason, they say, "Okay, I don't want to do it." Just don't. It just goes out of uh, their orbit of consideration also. So reasons are required. But in general, what happens? Every tradition, see, we, there are different levels of learning. See, it's, uh, suppose, say, all of us, we learn, we learn Hindi. Say, we, we, if you know, learn Hindi or English. Now, we will be able to speak in English, but if we have to teach English to someone, how did you form the sentence? Now, why this over here instead of this? Why singular here? Why plural here? Now, we may not be able to explain that so well. So basically, there is, there is, they call it as enacted knowledge and articulated knowledge. Enacted knowledge is the way we act and articulated knowledge is the way we express. So, or we could call it embodied knowledge. Embodied means what we act. So, for all of us, our embodied knowledge is much bigger than our articulated knowledge. So, what we know and we act. That embodied, with practically every field, embodied knowledge is bigger than the articulated knowledge. Embodied knowledge is also a form of knowledge. Like if say it's again three, four year old kids are playing, they may play, they may be playing a particular game and they may be following the rules of the game also. But if you ask them, okay, what are the rules of this game? Uh, they might not be able to tell very clearly. They know, okay, we should do not do like this, we should do like this, but they can't tell it. So same way what happens, in general, in any tradition, there are rituals and there are reasons for the rituals. So the rituals are a part of the embodied knowledge. The reasons are the part of the articulated knowledge. And in general, the rituals being a part of the embodied knowledge are remembered longer than the reasons. So if you consider broad culture is there, there are Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudras, Everybody would follow some religion in some way. And so the rituals would become a part of their embodied knowledge. And that would be known to everyone. But the articulated knowledge, the reasons are generally known only to the Brahmanas. So that's why sometimes the parent may be following something and they may, they may be benefited by it also, but they may not be able to tell. And that's why some forum where the kids can ask questions from somebody for whom those rituals are not just a part of the embodied knowledge, 
but also the articulated knowledge. Then they can answer. Sometimes we know the answer to a question, but when we tell it, it doesn't come out as convincingly. We ask some, some devotee who is an expert speaker, expert preacher, and they answer, hey, I know all these points, but it just didn't come together that way. So what happens is that we need to, oh, for, for us to become effective outreachers, I'm creating this word now. <laughs> the word preacher sounds very judgmental. <laughs> so outreacher. So for us to do outreach effectively, the more and more knowledge we have to bring it from the embodied knowledge to the, embo to the articulated knowledge. So when we do that, then it becomes more effective. Okay, thank you. Yes, we'll come to you. Yeah. So whatever we speak like even though it is truth, it has to be we, whatever we say it has to be truthful, pleasing, beneficial and non agitating. Non agitating, yes. Anudvega karambakyam. If it is agitating, then what happens? Uh, see, most people don't come to spiritual gatherings for enlightenment. They come for peace of mind. They come for peace. Of, I want to be feel peaceful. I want to, yesterday I talked about three levels. Spirituality is a level of reality, as a state of mind and as a process. So most people come for that, that peace of mind. They want to feel good. So we, they come for peace of mind and we give them a peace of our mind. <laughs> then there is a mismatch. <laughs> so <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yes, sir. You can, you can send one mic there. There's a mic behind you. One mic can go to Shri Krishna. Bro. Um, it's just a comment from Mataji. Mataji was uh, asking or he was telling about how kids uh, question mothers or parents and how uh, like our parents have like um, we haven't given the proper answer. Uh, we have just ignored the critical questions, you know, why this is being done or what. The also, one of the reasons we already gave because Brahmanas have not passed the knowledge, the correct knowledge to the, the mm -hmm. new generation, which is. And the second thing is, even though, suppose I know what, through the classes and all, in Krishna consciousness, what is the reason, because I learned a lot of things. The reasons actually why we do so and so rich by coming to Krishna consciousness. Yes, definitely. Rather than just being, I was Krishna consciousness, but in a passive, like you know, because I, I was like doing whatever my parents was was instructing me or guiding me or doing business. But the second part of it is also suppose now I'm experiencing as a mother. If my kid asks me so and so question, I won't be able to tell the reality of the, you know, I can tell overview of it. But suppose in depth I can't tell because sometimes the kids are inquisitive. If one question they will create the second question, the second question they will create the third question. So the third question answer we, we won't be able to give because it will be to that level. So it depends on the level of the, so it, it, we can learn from the kids actually uh, to 
to get them uh, the details about the yes. information. Yes, that's true. The education, what happened? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Let's come back here. Yeah. So, education means to speak according to the level. So, in every educational system that is there, say like we have given the standard example, 3 minus 5, we will tell it's not possible. But later on, the 3 minus 5 is minus 2. So, similarly, some reasons they may not be able to understand at that level. But then, you have to find out something which can at least pacify them at that point. And there are times when there can be, if we have parents meeting together and discussing, how would you answer this question? We, have, we observe preachers answering questions, because the same question you may ask to different preachers and different preachers may answer in different ways. And sometimes we feel like this is, this is a good way of answering this. This is that way. We can find out what answer works at that level. Certainly answers have to be given according to the level. So even for new people also we will answer a different place, for devotees we may answer in different ways. That is just a part of any system of education that there is a whole large body of knowledge. We can't unload all of that knowledge on people. So we have to give them what is appropriate at that level. But appropriate means it should also at a basic level satisfy them. Okay. Yes, Shri Krishna. So, I am just thinking uh, this is if we ask for something. So, uh, it also more depends on the culture in which you have been brought up. Because we come from a culture where we, we always been treated in the prescriptive way and that is how we are. Yeah. This, we, we also do it. With so, our kids also, like, you are to also in the same way. So. But as I learned from this seminar, this is so, how we should be applying this going ahead in terms of how we can take this literature uh, lessons. Also, considering the daily Vanasha and the language, how should I be in an ideal way? So, can you explain that aspect as compared to what we should be learning and how we should be okay. mm. If we consider, we came from a descriptive background and we also try to share a descriptive way. But what should we be doing today in today's society and what was it in Daivi Varanashram system also? Mm, let's take this first about the Daivi Varanashram. If you see, the Mahabharata has 110,000 verses and Vyasadeva doesn't spare even one fourth of a verse to name who is the guru of the Pandavas. Who was the guru? Drona was their martial teacher, Dhaumya was their priest. Who was their guru? See, what? There is no mention actually in the Mahabharata. The point I am making is not that they didn't have a guru, they did have, they, they did, they were guided by Narad Muni, by Vyasadeva himself, by Markandeya, by many rishis. In general, the traditional culture was that not so much like subservience to one guru as, uh, as reverence for a guru varga, for the Brahminical class. So, Vyasa, so the Pandavas would learn from many, many teachers. And Vyasadeva, if you see that, that's all within the Ramayana also. So, our movement started in what you could say a very historically unusual or anomalous way. Because Prabhupada went from India to America and he was speaking to people who were not, who had no inkling of spiritual culture. Hmm. I recently we were talking with one devotee and that devotee was telling me, is a senior devotee, now. he said the first time I came to a temple and when this whole, this, this is singing got over, and then, when the conch blew, so I said, I was wondering, when you blow the conch, why does everyone kiss the floor? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there is no idea what was going on. So, for that particular setting, Prabhupada was their only teacher. Hmm? So, in many ways, Prabhupada laid a lot of emphasis on the position of the spiritual master. 
and that is important now spiritual master is important no doubt at the same time if you look at Prabhupada's own life Prabhupada heard from Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur a few times seven eight times he interacted with him other times he was in Gaudiya Mat, he was interacting with his god brothers he was reading books because he read Vishwanath Thakur's commentaries he learned from multiple sources it was not just his spiritual master giving him instructions and uh, so the point which I'm making here is traditionally also it was you could say it was definitely the vertical aspect was more but it was not like there's one authority to whom you outsource all the responsibility for decision making you just tell me what to do and I will do it it was not like that it was say you see even Yudhishthira Maharaj when he felt that I I am I am I am responsible for this bloodshed and I want to renounce the world uh, many elders, Vyasdev, Narad Muni, they all, they all told him no. But none of them said, I am your guru and you have to obey me. That was not the mood over there. They all tried to make him see reason. And even Krishna did not resort to his authority. I am God, you have to obey me. Ultimately, it is Bhishma Dev who spoke and that was what persuaded Yudhishthira. So the idea, that, that means in principle, there is submission which has to be there. But in practice, it's more of persuasion and negotiation. It's persuasion. We see, uh, Yudhishthira Maharaj had to be persuaded to do a particular thing. Not that he had, he had to be dominated, just do it. And we see negotiation, when Dhruva Maharaj was told by Narad Muni, and Dhruva Maharaj felt insulted and went to the forest, Narad Muni told him, you're a child, children don't take insults so seriously. And if you think you're not a child, then as you grow old, actually, if you are spiritually advanced, you should see honor, dishonor equally. And either way, don't take it seriously. And then he told him, he was respectful, he says, what you are saying is a true instruction, but it doesn't apply for me. I am too badly hurt. So please, don't tell me to see honor, dishonor equally. Please tell me how I can rectify my dishonor. By getting a post that is more honorable than that of my father. What is because my father and my grandfather also. And Narad Muni did not condemn him for his disobedience. Narad Muni guided him accordingly. He appreciated his determination and guided him accordingly. So in general, the, the principle of obedience to higher authority is always there. But in practice, the authority doesn't throw their weight around and force people to do things. It is more that authority persuades. And sometimes the subordinate subord may also negotiate. You know, I, don't know, I, I don't think I can do this. And then they arrive at a mutually understandable conclusion. Because ultimately, it is for the individual to apply it. And if the individual is not convinced, and individual is not motivated, you force them, you cannot do it for very long. You cannot do it wholeheartedly, it will not be done. So, even traditionally, the word of the Brahmanas was uh, taken seriously. And certainly, people, nobody wanted to displease Brahmanas. Being cursed by a Brahmana was something which is a matter of great fear. But at the same time, it is not that the, even the Brahmanas would go, go around uh, bossing people and forcing them to do what they wanted, what, what they wanted. Even if it is good for them, it is more of persuasion. So I think it's uh, broadly, now also we see uh, the movement has become so big and many of the spiritual masters have many, many disciples. So we are now in some ways moving towards the traditional way of things. That we learn from many, many teachers. Of course, our spiritual master is our foremost teacher. And if our spiritual master gives a specific instruction, then we definitely should follow that. But generally, the spiritual masters may not give direct specific instructions. So we have to become a responsible human beings, and we have to take responsibility for our spiritual advancement. So the the locus of responsibility always lies with the individual. It is not with the institution. It is not that by affiliating with the scorn we are going to get spiritually advanced. Yes, yeah, it's important to be affiliated with the institution, but it is we who have to practice and by that we will go advance. So, in general I have seen that uh, even in the tradition, the normative way was not that much. So, the parents might instruct, but it even Chanakya Pandit also says, you know, up to a particular power point, you know, what is that? Panchavarshani lalayet, dashavarshani tadatet, prapte tu shodashe varshe, 
putra mitravat acharit. So he says, when they are up to the age of five, just, just pamper the child, just shower love on the child. Pancha varshani lalayit, dasha varshani tadayit. For the next ten years, discipline the child. Don't do this, do this. But prapte to shodashe varshe. That once the child reaches maturity, then putra mitravat acharit. Treat, like, treat the child like a friend, like an equal. So, uh, I think there is a time, there is an overall time when even the spiritual master may not give direct instructions. The spiritual master may also tell, do this. Now, the disciple may take it as a as an instruction, but sometimes spiritual master may tell also. I have seen my spiritual master and other spiritual master also when I talk. Don't, it says, don't take this as an instruction. Now, see if this works for you. So, I think there has to be a there has to be a respect for people's individuality. Now, that respect doesn't mean that we are blind and don't give them any guide. We let, if they are going on the wrong track, we let them go. But it's just that we don't force them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So actually, this brings us to the next point. Can you just go ahead? Please go ahead, please. <laughs> Yeah, so this is what I, sen sen being sensitive is the balance between being sentimental and being sensible. Now, why the balance? Being sensible means that you know, yeah, this is what makes sense. This doesn't make sense. This is what you should do. Otherwise, you will be you will be harmed by it. So, being sentimental means that we are simply concerned that person should not feel hurt. That person should not feel alienated. That person we are only concerned about the person's feelings. Being sensible means we are concerned only about the facts. Say, if somebody has diabetes and they are eating sweets. Now, if, they, if that sweets is harmful for them, if they want to eat sweets, I can, how can I tell them not to take sweets? That will be a sense of sentiment. But if we simply come off and dominate them, then they will get alienated. We have to be sensitive. I don't, maybe if they are taking sweets, don't tell them in front of everyone, don't take sweets. You know, they also have their sense of self-respect or whatever. So, we have to tell it a little discreet way. So, being sensible is important. And we can't be sentimental. Sensitivity means that we consider people's feelings. It's not that we consider only their feelings. We have to consider the facts also. But we don't have to uh, neglect their feelings and we don't have to neglect their facts. So that, that balance is, is actually to some extent an art. Say for example, if somebody is following some other spiritual teacher and they believe their spiritual teacher is God. So if they ask us in a public class, what do you think about so and so? Now, some devotees for them preaching means what? They are just heard some script and they download it. <laughs> so and so is a fool. So and so is a rascal. <laughs> now, now, those people don't even know where we are coming from. So, what we do, uh, if we, they will, how can you, I respect this teacher so much and you call him like this? Who do you think you are to call like that? They can get completely alienated by that. So, if in public forum they are asking, yes. so what, see broadly speaking what I do is, when I, see as yesterday I told that philosophy is not a major reason why people come to any spiritual path. It is only one part of it. So, while talking about other spiritual teachers, I talk about, I divide it. You know. Say if so and so spiritual teacher, you know as far as the humanitarian work that they have done, they may have opened hospitals, they may have opened schools, they are feeding hungry people. And the humanitarian work that they have done, yes. Maybe in India there is a lot of poverty and humanity that is laudable. And sometimes even from a cultural perspective, now they, even by following those teachers, people may have a broad reverence for cows, reverence for deities, reverence for Vedic culture. So from a cultural perspective also, they have helped, they've helped people stay in the broad purview of Vedic culture. And maybe at that point, there is no need to speak the philosophy. So in a public forum, we can See, everybody has something good in them. And we say that we can even look for gold in, a, in filth. 
So, if somebody is a suspect is respected spiritual teacher, we can see what is respectable in them. And, when, and the devotees were in Puri for the first time, then the Puri temple management was not allowing the Western devotees to go into the temple. So, at that time, in that part of India, Swami Chinmananda was respected a lot. So, Prabhupada told the devotees to go to Swami Chinmananda, and then Swami Chinmananda, the devotees talked to Swami Chinmananda, and he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter saying that, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, yeah, it's okay. Okay. So, he wrote a letter saying that, you know, I have interacted with these devotees, with these is Hare Krishna devotees and they are very faithful Vaishnavas, they follow these principles, they avoid these things. So, because they are sincere Krishna Bhaktas, they should be allowed into the temple. And when Prabhupada saw that letter, he was very happy. And Prabhupada said, he appreciate the devotee. You have got Swami Chinmaya and letter to devotional service now. So, now he had a particular position in society and Prabhupada respected that. And if that position can be used for a particular purpose, we don't have to alienate them. So, if somebody is respected in society as a spiritual teacher, now from the philosophical perspective that spiritual teachings might be, might be wrong. But most people do not go to a spiritual teacher because of the philosophy. This philosophy is only one part of it. So, therefore, uh, we cannot be sentimental and say that that person is God, yes we also worship is God, not like that. But we do not have to be completely uh, insensitive and criticize them. So, we can contextualize as far as and if somebody says, oh my spiritual teacher is God, then we may have to say, actually who is God is told in Shastra and we have to say whether there is explicit reference for this. There is no reference then we cannot accept something like that. So, we can be polite about it. So, we need to be, we cannot be sensible only nor can we be sentimental only. We be sensitive as a balance between the two. Can you go ahead? So now this is a principle that you know, say if you have a three or four year old child you know, and a child has a room and the room is all dirty, messed up, you know, toys are hurled over here, the socks is here, the shoes are there, the books are here and you come to that room, you tell the child, clean the room and then you go away and you expect after half an hour the room should be clean. <laughs> and you come back, now for the child at the age of three, they may not even understand what a clean room means. So, you may have to, now if you want, now for the child, see, if you consider actually what cleaning a room means, you know, it is a clean room is actually an abstract concept, it is an abstract concept. For us it is very clear, but for the child it may not be very clear. So, a clean room might mean many very different concrete actions. One might mean that, okay, you know, this, this this toy should go here, the sock should go here, and these clothes have to go into this bag, they have to go to this closet. You know? So, there are so many different actions which fall in the category of a clean room. Now, for us, we know it very clearly, but they may not know it at all. So, then we can, if you have to tell a child, what do you do? Do you see that teddy bear? Oh, yes. Can you pick it up? Oh yeah, and then you pick it up, and can you go and put it in that rack? A child knows what is the rack, okay, go and put it in the rack and they look at you and you smile at them and the child feels good and then you feel good and then okay, now can you take up these socks, can you put this there and then you tell like this gradually through the specific guidelines, then the child starts understanding what a clean room means. So, clean room is very very clear in our mind, but for the child it is not very clear. So, similarly, now with respect to child and parent, this is very easy to understand. But we often have certain abstract conceptions. What do you know? Say, for example, if somebody says that, if somebody tells us, you are you are very insensitive. We are talking about sensitivity only. But you wonder, what do you mean by insensitive? See, okay, you know, at this point, you know, I had told you to do this, but you did not, you did not do it, and you did not even mention why you didn't do it. Or at this point, this was this was what happened, and you didn't even acknowledge me, you did not even appreciate me, whatever. So now, what sensitivity means 
for one person may be very different from what sensitivity means for another person. So when we, yeah, this is sensitivity means that instead of just telling people you are not doing, you are like this or you are like this. No, give specific actions. Now this is what you know. I expected should be done, but it was not done. So if if we tell somebody you are irresponsible. Now, irresponsible is a very big category. Now, what there is person A and person B, what person A puts in the category of irresponsibility and what person B puts in the category of irresponsibility might be very different. So, <clears throat> somebody might say irresponsibility means that, okay, I have to do this, this, this and I am doing it. How can you call me irresponsible? But for somebody else, say, Irresponsibility means you know you should you're not doing this this this. So I never knew that this is what you expected of, of responsibility. We are now living in a society where because there's so much changes that have happened that what role who is expected to play. Traditionally it was quite clear, but now it is not so clear. I was in uh, Seattle and one devotee was telling me that. Oh, he, he, uh, he and his wife, both of them work in office and he says, my wife often faces a lot of uh, gender discrimination at the workplace and when she comes back, she is very upset and he says that I was reading a purport of Shri Prabhupada where Prabhupada says that, you know, after the husband works very hard and comes back from a tired day's workplace and when the wife comes, she speaks some soft, soothing words and the husband's anxiety is relieved. So he said, every day when I come back home, my wife is agitated and I have to pacify her. <laughs> so he said, you know, who is playing what role over here? <laughs> so the thing is that society has changed a lot. So now it is that, now because society has changed, so it's not that we don't have uh, stereotypes. There are certain, I'm not using the word stereotype in the negative sense. We have certain expectations of what a role is meant to be. But that particular, our real life doesn't conform to that role because society has changed. So each person in a relationship may have different expectations of what the role is. So, so unless the expectations are clarified, then we may offer value judgmental statements. Like yesterday this question was raised, how to be non-judgmental. So non-judgmental means become more specific of what was expected and what was not done. So like there is a, don't give abstract evaluations. You are irresponsible, you are insensitive, uh, you are domineering, you do politics. Now ah, you do politics. Now what do you mean by politics? Yeah. Okay, no, no, you, you gave that service to that person, you didn't give that service to me and that person is belongs to your group. No, I give that service because that person is good at that service. You know, so when we give abstract evaluations like that, it simply polarizes. So being sensitive means avoiding abstract, abstract generalizations and giving specific points. If you are specific, then the specific points can be discussed. But if you are not specific, then all that happens is people just get alienated, people get polarized. Go ahead, please. So now with respect to sensitive, just two points, I'll conclude this, that sometimes it is, I want to be sensitive, so I won't get angry or I won't speak harshly, I won't yell at someone. Negative resolutions are actually very, very difficult to keep. Instead of that, it is always better to make a positive resolution. A positive resolution is that, say, I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. If somebody is upset with us, even if we, have, if we have made a mistake, now we would very much like that the person speak politely to us. Just as we would like to be spoken to politely, so the other person would also like to be spoken to politely. So, if we think of it in this term, this is much more positive. Yes, I will speak politely, I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. Then, it becomes more, it becomes easier for us. It's a, it's a small mental switch, but that mental switch it's okay. It's not that I am repressing my emotion. Why should I repress my emotion? This person has done wrong and I have to tell them that it's wrong. I won't repress my emotion. Yes, it's not repressing the emotion. It's that this person is also individual. They also have feelings and they also 
they are also souls, they are human beings, they deserve to be spoken to politely. So, I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. So, sensitivity is not about repressing our emotions. It is about, we have to find a balance between, the one extreme is repressing our emotions, the other is dismissing others' emotions. We respect other people's emotions and then we respect our own emotions also and we speak in a way that both are taken care of. So when we have this idea that I will respect everyone's uh, right to be spoken to politely, then by that we will be able to move forward and we will be able to understand better how <coughs> we can take things forward. So this is one way of being sensitive. Another way is, can you go ahead please? That <coughs> when we have to deal with some conflict, if some person has done something wrong, and we feel this person is very different from us. Like I studied, the point was there that two people have very different perspectives. Yes, <coughs> but even if there are 99% differences, begin with the 1% similarity. 1% similarity. When we begin with that, then we start with a ground of agreement. Say for example, you know, we want Janma Janmashtami to be done in the temple and we are a part of the team. So we feel that, oh, for Janmashtami, we should have a big drama. Somebody else feels, oh, we don't have space in the temple to do a drama. We will just have some puja or aarti or some abhishek of kavach, abhishek of kalash, and then we can raise funds for that. Now, these two people may have strong disagreement, what to do? Now, if we say, no, this is what you should do. Now, actually, we, our temple needs funds, we want to raise funds, through kalash we can raise funds. Now, ultimately, the other person may say, we want to build a community. You know, if our congregation children do dramas, they all participate, they will all, they can all do the drama and it will, we will all come closer to each other. Now, both of them ultimately have the same purpose, that is to serve Krishna, that is to glorify Krishna. So, we begin with the 1% similarity. First, they are also trying to serve Krishna, I am also trying to serve Krishna. Now, in particular situations, a particular course of action may be chosen. But, if we just focus on, you never listen to me, you always focus on having your way only. But ultimately their way is also for serving Krishna. For us what happens, whenever there are differences with someone, those differences uh, overshadow our perception. And all that we see is, that person didn't listen to me, that person opposed me, that person uh, dominated and had their own way. And then when that difference overshadows, the many things that are common, we forget them. And Srila Prabhupada, uh, so when he came back to India for the first time with his disciples, he introduced some of his disciples to his god brothers. And some of his god brothers were very appreciative, but some of his god brothers were a little, uh, you could say, uh, they, started, uh, they started telling Prabhupada's disciples that, Actually, Bhakti Sanayana Swami gives only basic teachings. You come to us, we will tell you more advanced things about Radha Krishna. And when they started pulling some of Prabhupada's disciples, Prabhupada became very upset. And there was one particular God brother, Prabhupada very strongly spoke about him. He said, he is an envious snake. Don't ever go near him. And then, what happens for, at that time, Prabhupada's words were like the word of God for devotees. So that, oh, he's like an envious snake, he's like an envious snake, he's like an envious snake. And then what happened? Some devotees went and told him also. <laughs> now, the Prabhupada said like that. Now, oh, he was very upset by that. And then eventually he fell sick and he passed away. And when he passed away, then devotees came and told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, where did he go? The devotees sometimes get something like a perverse glee. Okay, which hell did he go to? So where, what was his destination? Where did he go to? And Prabhupada was very grave. Prabhupada said, he went back to the spiritual world. And the devotees were shocked. Prabhupada, you said he was an envious snake. He said, Prabhupada said, He's, he served my spiritual master through his life, throughout his life. And my spiritual master is very powerful. So, for protecting his disciples, Prabhupada spoke that statement contextually. That, you know, he's an envious snake. He's a, but that did not blind Prabhupada to the big picture. 
that he had also taken sannyas at a young age, he had dedicated his life to Prabhupada, spreading Bhakti Sanskaraku's mission, and he had followed the vows of serving spiritual master faithfully. So sometimes what happens, we look at one particular flaw in a person and we let that define our entire perception of the person. Now from our perspective, now from Prabhupada's perspective at that time, he had to protect his disciples and he spoke strongly to protect his disciples. But in his consciousness, he did not see that God brother simply in a negative way. He saw that God brother also as a disciple of his spiritual master. So what happens when we, we get overrun by emotions, our emotions distort our perspective. And then when the emotions distort our perspective that we might actually have 99% similarity and 1% difference. But that 1% difference is what we see in the whole per person. Uh, this person is like this, this person is like this, this person is like this. So to, now, now, now here we are talking about not just that we should be sensitive, but how can we develop the sensitivity? by seeing the full person, not just the area where they disagree with us. So, we will conclude this with an exercise. Can you go ahead? Okay, so again, so if you want to make a resolve, someone said, I will never criticize anyone. Now that is something which is very difficult to follow. And again, we might just feel repressed. This person has been so bad to me, how can I not criticize? But a more positive resolve would be that Whenever I see, this is a, actually an Upanishadic saying or a Vedic saying, it comes from the Vedas that whenever you see anyone, let your first thought about that person be positive. Let your first thought about that person be positive. That means that we may have negative interactions with that person, we may have negative opinions about that person. But let the first thought be positive. So I heard recently that Prabhupada told uh, that the Gurukul teachers in Vinda, uh, in Vindavan or Dallas that, that there are some students, some students are very very mischievous, and they do this wrong, that wrong, that wrong, that wrong. So what happens is that the teachers have to find faults. So when the devotees when the devotees went to Prabhupada, Prabhupada told them. That when that boy comes to Gurukul tomorrow, tell him, you are breathing so nicely. <laughs> what breathing? What is, a, what is nice about breathing? <laughs> it's appreciate something. <laughs> so, let the first thought about the person about whom we are see be positive. So this will, we'll conclude with one exercise now. Can you go ahead please? Yeah. So for three people with whom this you can, can you, either you give a phone or a book or something and you can write this down. Think of three people with whom you interact regularly and your interactions with them tend to be spicy. <laughs> Where you, know, you tend to think negatively, they tend to think negatively about you and write down three good qualities about them, which you normally overlook. See, the idea is, even if we decide, hey, it's nice, let my first thought about others be positive. But when we see them, that thought will not come at that time. So unless we have consciously written it down. So we can have about uh, three to three minutes for this. You can just write down three thoughts and next time when you see that person, next time you interact with that person, try to think of that, those qualities.
Okay. Okay, one minute more. How many of you have completed? One minute more in complete. So, I'll summarize what I spoke. Are there any one or two reflections? We are already over time, but is any one or two reflection points anyone would like to share till now? Yes. Is it a question or reflection? Uh, reflection come question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, definitely. If there are many words like that. Preaching is one word. Even Indra Maharaj had his diary of traveling preacher, 
Now we have changed the diary of a traveling monk. So even sin is not a very good word. I was with a, at an interfaith conference. They said it is sinful to use the word sinful. <laughs> so preaching is not so good. Even cult, cult more or less. Prabhupada would use it, but we have almost retired it now. We don't use it at all. All the Prabhupada used it frequently. There are several words like that. Mm. Oh, very strongly. But in Prabhupada's time, it did not have. 1965-66, it just meant a group of people. <laughs> Prabhupada used it quite freely. But now it doesn't have. There are five, six words like that. Cult, preaching, then sin is there, as I mentioned. Hell. Hell, hell is also people don't uh, it's, it's quite alienating for people and sorry yeah people prefer the word spirituality to religion I think that is the whole question which I'll probably discuss in the if we can discuss about it yeah but we can use the word spiritual instead of religion as much as possible in fact if you don't want the word spiritual we could use the word tradition in our tradition we do like this traditions are respected very much in my religion, I don't talk about your religion. The religion seems, somehow it's, seen, it's got a negative connotation. It's become sectarian. So, it's because words have particular connotations in people's minds. And unless we are aware of those connotations, we will unnecessarily give people a different impression than what we wanted to give them. So, the word, meanings of words also change with time. Past, I, should, that, 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 I think there are two different things. One is, there are words which have negative connotations and there are words which are not comprehensible. So, pastime is, what do you mean by pastime? There are many words like that, which people just don't, now the word ecstasy also, is a drug called ecstasy. <laughs> so, ecstasy, that word is better not used, especially when we are talking with outside people. Mm, yeah, scripture is... I actually, yeah, could use it, but it has too much of a religious connotation. You could use wisdom texts, wisdom texts like the Bhagavad Gita. So, generally, uh, if we use words that don't speak about that, that don't talk about sect, that don't come off as sectarian or domineering or that kind of thing. So, instead of rituals, we use the word practices or or ceremony. Ceremony is also good. But practices is very good. There is no problem at all. Mm, in fact, instead of absolute truth, the word preferred is ultimate reality. Absolute truth sounds like, you think you know the absolute truth? No, it's a, it, the word absolute itself has a sort of negative connotation to it. So, absolute truth, it is no, ultimate reality. So, we are looking for ultimate reality. So, that way, uh, we can learn to use in the in academic circles or in, in colleges instead of soul we use the word consciousness it's the same thing but the focus is different mm. instead of uh, I, I was with uh, Bhakti Marg Maharaj Bhakti Marg Maharaj actually is, he walks across Canada he's famous he's known as the walking monk so he was telling that when he meets people you know he, may, may God bless you people don't like to use the word God so he says, he says, may the source be with you. <laughs> now, <laughs> that is a, the source is ultimately Krishna is the source. But he's playing around in the Star Wars series that may the force be with you. <laughs> so may the force be with you. May the force be with you. May the source be with you. <laughs> so sometimes we have to make sure that our communication doesn't alienate people. I remember I came from uh, I was giving a class here in Australia only, maybe two, three years ago. A corporate program was there. So, mostly Australians were there and I said that, somebody asked me, how did you choose the spiritual path? So, then I spoke, after I passed out from my college. <laughs> I said, looking strangely, they pass out means fall unconscious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, in India, pass out means graduate. <laughs> they have to be sensitive, yes. Anything else? Oh, yeah. 
definitely. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Out preaching is nobody wants to be preached to. <laughs> it is, you know, you mean you are going to sit on a high pedestal and you are going to you are going to instruct me what to do. No, I don't want to do that. There will be time when this outreach word also will become reserved. This becomes reserved. Oh yeah, definitely. In fact, you know the the Catholic Catholic Church has a whole committee that retranslates the Bible every twenty five years. Because words keep the meanings keep changing, so uh, we need to be sensitive to the words of uh, how words are used at particular times. Yeah, should should yeah, must. Yes, should should not be used. <laughs> 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 so should and must are not so desirable. Must also is a, it's it's we need we need to do this or we can do this. It's better to do this. It's a should the some of the word should is who are you telling me should it becomes like that. Even spiritual is uh, nowadays in academic circles spiritual is uh, differently referenced by saying non-material. Yeah, instead of spiritual, you use the word non-material. Yeah, I think see there are there are the popularity of words. You consider mindfulness is much more acceptable than meditation. You know, we are having a session on mindfulness. Oh, very much, very good. We are having a meditation. It seems a little bit otherworldly. We are having a spiritual session. Okay, okay. That seems a little more otherworldly. We are going to have a religious program. No, 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 not at all. So you could put them on a spectrum. Religious is widely unacceptable. Spiritual is much more acceptable. Meditation is. meditation or yoga are much more acceptable than spiritual also because many people think that yoga is not really spiritual <coughs> yoga is for health meditation is for the mind so and mindfulness is is very trendy if you have a mindfulness program you can go anywhere and say you can we can have a mindfulness program people say yes we want to be mindful there is actually a group coming or speak group spiritual but not religious. oh yeah it's called sbnr spiritual but not religious so they say that we don't want to be sectarian we don't want to be narrow minded since the subject has come up i'll just explain this who had asked this question to me yesterday madam mm, mataji had asked me nobody is mataji is not here today probably so i'll just what how do we are, are you spiritual or are you religious if somebody asks us now what do we tell them at that time so we may say that so now are you spiritual or are you religious so basically as i said when people use the word religious they have the idea of either ritualistic or narrow minded mm-hmm. they are ritualistic or dogmatic dogmatic means this is right that is wrong so ritualistic when you do things you don't even know why you are doing those things you become narrow minded you become sectarian so people are not interested in religion that's that's what they connote with religion now this was not the connotation of religion maybe for 40 50 years ago Uh, Albert Einstein has used the word religious many times. You know, this is a deeply religious outlook I have towards the universe, and a sense of religious experience that I get when I look at the majesty of the universe, the order in the universe. But the word has acquired a negative connotation now. So, so when they use the word spiritual, their idea is we are open-minded. We want to learn more about. We want to feel good. We want to get peace. We want to be tolerant, grateful, kind. like that so spiritual has all those connotations so the main thing is religious means they think you become narrow minded because you affiliate with a particular group and then you become close to everything else i was at an interfaith meeting so one pastor was telling we had a program a radio show there was a, there was a person he said i am a christian but i am not affiliated with any church so then he said this pastor told me that i asked gently So why are you not affiliated with any church? He says I haven't yet found any church that agrees with my philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so they got the priority wrong, you know. They don't go to the church to learn. They already know. <laughs> Is there a church that agrees to me? Agrees with me? So, so their idea is that they don't want to 
become close-minded by affiliating themselves to any particular group. Now, the way I explain it is that if we consider at the mountain, the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness, the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness. And we want to become spiritual means we want to become, we are, go to the top of the mountain, see things from a higher perspective. If we naturally go from a higher perspective, we will become more broad-minded, more open, more understanding, all virtues will come. And at the same time, we can't just imagine that we are on top of the mountain. We have to take a path to go up the mountain. And the path that we take to go up the mountain, that is religion. So, we, if somebody says that, I want to go to the top of the mountain, but I don't want to follow any path. Well, then how will you get there? You want to be grateful, you want to be humble, you want to be tolerant, you want to be sensitive. How will you develop all these qualities? You have to follow some process for that. So, so now that process is religion. Now, they may not want to use the word religion for it. And many people are religious but not spiritual. That means what happens is, they are doing their religious doctrine, religious, religious practices or they have their religious doctrines, but their consciousness is not raised up. They are still very narrow-minded. They, if they are then narrow-minded, then people just get alienated. See? Some people, they have a particular religious path, but instead of going up their path, uh, going up the mountain by that path, they keep walking down below the mountain and pulling everybody else from their path. <laughs> so, our understanding is that yes, we are following this path, but there are other paths up the mountain also. There are other paths up the mountain also and Prabhupada appreciated Jesus he said he had he was is our guru because he had so much love for God that he was ready to get, give, give up his life for the service of God. So, so a person who has so much love, we respect him. So we acknowledge that love for God can be attained by different paths. So in that sense, we are not narrow-minded. That this is the only way. That's not the attitude. But sometimes in spiritual people say that oh, you know, whatever you follow, you follow that. It's all it's all relative. It's not like that. We can't say that any and every path will take you up the mountain. Some paths will take you away from the mountain. Some path may take you down into a valley also. So we want to be open-minded, but we can't be so open-minded that our brain falls out. <laughs> Isn't it? So there has to be some objective understanding. So the idea is that we say that we are spiritual and we follow certain practices because if we say we are only spiritual and we say we are not religious, but we dress in a particular way, we, t we have particular prayers, we have particular chants, so people will label us as religious because of that. So if we, only when we understand the philosophy and explain the world, that there are different paths we accept and we follow this path. But if others follow other paths, we respect that also. So that way, we can focus on we are spiritual, but then people say that you are all these things are sectarian, no, so that is, we follow this, but we don't impose this on everyone else. This is our way, to grow spiritually. So if you put it that way, then people don't, uh, don't feel so uh, threatened by it. It's more when people want to say, people say we are religious but not spiritual, simply they don't want to affiliate themselves with something which is sectarian. They don't want to become, they don't want to become narrow minded. That is the main concern that people have. Okay? And of course, that's the positive concern, the negative concern, or the, the negative concern, in, a negative aspect of that, they don't want to commit to anything. Just they say, why do I commit to any spiritual practice? But it's like, if you want to climb up a mountain, you have to commit to a particular path of the mountain. Otherwise, how will you get to the top of the mountain? So, if it's explained objectively, then it's understandable. But it's better to use the word spiritual rather than religious. And if you use the word religious, we explain religion as a means to spiritual consciousness, not just as a set of beliefs or set of rituals. Then it becomes more easily understandable. So thank you very much. Shla Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Thai Gaur Pramanande. Hare Krishna. So now we have breakfast. After breakfast will be at um, 10, 10.30. And the last. We'll make it 10.40. 10.50. 10.50. No, 10.45. 10.45 and then the last session. After that, lunch. Yeah. So, uh, I will ask Radhikaram Prabhu to give specific instructions in terms of cleaning your rooms and taking your luggage etc. out so that uh